for you on Facebook, uh, we're in the middle of the service. I'm getting ready to deliver the message here at Corner Church. So we welcome you into the message. And we just give God glory and praise and thanksgiving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we glorify you. And Father, we praise you and thank you, Father, for all things. And Father, now in the name of Jesus, Father, as we come to your word, Father. Father, we come to your word in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And Father, it is by your word, Father, that you bring all things to light that we need, Father, by your Holy Spirit quickening your word. There's not a thing that happens to us in this world. There's not a thing that goes on in this world, whether it be for us or whether it be for the world itself, our nation, our community, etc. You are truly the answer. And Father, as earlier, Father, as you know, we sang those hymns of how great thou art. And, you know, all the worlds your hands have made in your hands, Father. And of course, then we also sang, precious Lord, take my hand. Father, when we walk with you, Father, when we walk with you according to your will, you know, as Jesus said, our Father art in heaven, how be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And Father God, it is your will, Father, for us to be walking each and every moment of every day. So, Father God, as we come to your word, Father, we come to your word, Father, for strengthening, for revitalization, for healing. Father, all in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the name above all names and all power and authority over all things of heaven and earth, who shed his blood for the remission, forgiveness of our sins that we might have life, taking victory over death through the resurrection. So, Father God, as we come to your word this morning, I just pray for your quickening Holy Spirit that your word might be manifested to fulfill whatever that need is, all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. I yield and humble myself to lead of your Holy Spirit, that it might be your words and not mine, through thy Holy Son, Jesus' name, amen and amen. This morning, uh, I'm going to begin in the Gospel of Matthew. And in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, but we're going to end up going back to 2 Kings, I think, uh, to give you a heads up. 2 Kings 23 and 1 Kings 13. You know, I'm not sure in which order now, but we'll find out. Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to begin in verse 9, but the first eight verses in the Matthew is Jesus showing and telling the people that he is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And as I try to look at it each and every day that I live in the resurrection, you know, I'm living also in the Sabbath with Jesus. You know, because Jesus and God told us that the Sabbath is a day of rest, day of peace. You know. And if I want to live each and every day at peace with God, I have ceased from my own works and just letting God have control of my life. I don't remember when this transpired exactly, but I think it was about shortly after 99, 1999, when I had that real encounter with the Lord, that, that point in life, I said, Lord, now understand, not my way, but your way. It was a transition point. And so for the last roughly 20 years, I had two different plates on the front of my car. One is the one that started out being on the car, but now it's on the pickup, and I've got another one on the car. The one that started out is God is my pilot. I don't know whether Vivian bought it for me or where it came about or whether it got about, I don't remember, but I, I, you know, I drove that pickup, you know, that I had back then all the time. I guess it was Tahoe first. God is my pilot. Yeah. And then... I also have, I can do all things through Christ with strength me. So now I've got the pallet and 
Christ strengthened me. Yeah. And it's a message, not to it, just a people that see it, whether I pull into a parking lot or anything. It's a message to me. It's a message to me and a reminder when I walk outside to get into my vehicle, whichever one it is. Yeah. Well, see, that's the same way with God's word. When we come to God's word, even before we go to the word, God realizes and already knows what we need. What word we need to hear. It's been a blessing in ways that I couldn't have imagined with doing the devotionals that I do generally daily as well as in the two to three live messages that I've been doing. And on the text that I send out to those in the church, most of the devotionals do not have a title on them. Sometimes I go back and add it to it. But then the one that I paste in on post on Facebook has a title. I don't put the title on the beginning because I still haven't figured out what the title is supposed to be because I haven't figured out or know where God's going to lead me in that devotional or that message. And so after it's over, the title then, to title it, is obvious. Yeah. Now, sometimes God works in different ways. Sometimes I have an idea where God's going. But more often than not, I don't know where God's going with something. Because God and God alone knows. Jesus is truly Lord of the Sabbath and as we live in the resurrection, it's my feeling we also need to live in the Sabbath because we need to have ceased from our own works. And so now he begins in verse nine. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue and behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? That and they might that they might accuse him, and he said unto them, "What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore?" It is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. Then saith he unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against them how they might destroy him. Jesus shows us throughout the scriptures that by his stripes we are healed. God wants to bring healing and revitalization into each and every one of us. God wants us to be made whole. Spirit, soul, and body. Wholeness. But there's something about the hand that is interesting. First of all, in the Bible, it's used 1,427 times. It's a lot of times. And of course, as we sang in that song, you know, by God's hand, he made all of creation. And then after Adam and Eve were put forth out of the garden. He said, except you reach forth and take of the tree of life in your hand. Okay. Take it in your hand. And then 
A hand can be used in different ways. One of the ways that the hand can be used is against God's will, as he says actually in Genesis 16, 12. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brothers. And that was of Ishmael. You know, it's the fight that goes on yet today in this world. But it is by the word of God that God gives us truth and understanding of what he wants us to do. I'm going to go to 2 Kings 1st chapter 23 before I go back to 1 Kings. And in 2 Kings in 23 we see the Josiah's reform. Now Josiah is now the grandson grandson or great grandson of Zedekiah and I mean Hezekiah and it would be in Josiah's time frame that something would happen after Hezekiah's death. The thing that would happen is Manassas, his son, would become king. And Manassas was an evil king. The exact opposite of what Hezekiah was. And then after he passed, then it would be Ammon, who also was an evil king. Here comes Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Tells us that in, back in first verse of chapter 22. Only eight years old. Just a kid. Just a kid. But the scripture says that he had a heart after God. And the word was not even known in the land. But God gave him intuition and instinct to know that the way the Israelites, how Jerusalem had gotten carried off into the world of idolatry and worshiping of the idols and Baal and all this stuff, that he wanted to reform things. He wanted to rebuild the temple, fix up the house of God. So he set out to doing all kinds of reforms in the land. Breaking down the altars of, you know, Baal, doing all kinds of things to clean things up. First verse in chapter 23, it says, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all of the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up unto the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants with him and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. So if you go back and read the rest of the chapter of 22, you'll find out that the word of God had been lost. There was not even a priest that knew the word of God. There was not even a priest that could communicate the word of God. They were that ingrained in the ways of Baal and the idols. And, and it was actually even after they found the word, he sent, finally he found out that there was a prophetess and she knew and understood and they had sent for her. So let's back up to verse 15 of 22. It says, And she said unto him, Thus saith the Lord of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read, 
because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the words of their hands, and therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. And when Josiah had heard those words, it pained him in the heart, the reality of what was to come. So then he ended up being, well, you could say just going into high gear, cutting down the groves, just busting up this and busting up that. And then it comes to the point of the altars, verse 14 of 23. And he broke in pieces the images and cut down the groves and filled their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jerusalem, the son of Nabak, who made Israel to sin, had made both that this altar and the high places be broken down and burned in the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah, uh, uh, one thing, if you go back to the other, part of these altars was even where they were passing their sacrifices, their children through the fire of Molech. That's in verse 10 back here if you want to read it, of 22. Yeah. They burned their children as sacrifices. They passed them through the fire. See, when you just think of that, and you think of somebody that would pick up their one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, whatever, and take out and pass them to the fire. Sometimes when you go back and read it, they were even up into teen years sometimes. Sick. But let me tell you, this world is sicker than that today. Because with an abortion, that's exactly what they're doing. And unfortunately, they're losing the blessing of ever even knowing that life. And I forget now the counts up to around 60 million or something like that. Yeah. Unbelievable. But see, that's the way of the world today. That's the way of the world today. So now Josiah, while he's on this, you know, almost from a righteous rage standpoint, just destroying all this stuff. And he's just finished this last high place. Verse 16, where was that? So, and as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount, and he sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed for, pro, pro, who proclaimed these words. And he said, now wait, I'm going to just stop there. The word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. These words, we're going to get to them in a minute. These words of what he was doing was prophesied 326 years before this date. And this was happening 600 years before Christ would come to earth. God knows all things. And when we put our hand, when we say, precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, through the fire, through the storm, what we're recognizing is God is in control. And everything that's going on today in this world, God is in control. And we need to understand that. But what we individually have to do is we have to make a conscious decision that we're going to put our life in the Lord's hands. Because God knows what we need. There's nothing that God doesn't know. It says, then he said, as he turned around, he said, 
He said, then he said, what title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the sepulcher of the man of God which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. Josiah didn't even have an idea, and there's no way he could. Josiah's like you and I. Yeah. How could we know just intuitively what someone said that we were going to do at this very moment? It's like, I still think of a dear friend who's gone home to be at the Lord, Bernice McCray. And when I was still a teenager, and while I was still a teenager, that I was still doing more of the life the Lord would have me to lead. It was on Youth Sunday, and I had the sermonette that year. And after church was over, and we're in the back of the church, and of course, Bernice knew me from a baby, and she was one of my Sunday school teachers, and had known me to some extent better than I knew myself. I said, Dickie, someday you're going to be a preacher, a minister. Not what I wanted to do. Most of you know my testimony. I ran from that for about 40 years. Yeah. See, when we interface with people and we're not telling someone what we want to tell them, but when we're allowing this vessel to be the vessel for the Holy Spirit to work through, we don't even realize sometimes the prophetic words that we speak to somebody. And that's why we have to be extremely careful when we speak downwards and maybe evil outcomes to someone. Because it might even end up being putting a curse on someone's life. We don't know. See, God is a God of love. God's a God of uplifting. But God is also a God that desires us to serve him, as Vivian was talking about, serve him and him alone. We only bow to God. But as we go through each day, that's what we need to be doing. So as I come back to 1 Kings, chapter 13. And I don't have time to read all the scriptures this morning on this, so I'm going to tell you about this. I'm going to capsulize it. Jeroboam has now become the leader of the northern kingdoms because it was by Jeroboam and the dispute between Jeroboam and Rehoboam and became a split between the house of David Jeroboam had the northern kingdoms, which he had ten tribes, ten of the tribes. And he was evil of evils. And if you look at some of the things where he interfaced with Solomon and everything, like, you know, Solomon even tried to kill him one time, you know, because Solomon finally realized, you know, you know, who Jeroboam really was. There's a lot of things in this world, we don't realize what they are. And then all of a sudden, the light comes on. And it's antichrist type actions in individuals. See, that's what we're facing today. Because just like the word had disappeared for all those years before Josiah's rule, the fight today is to get rid of the word of God in the name of Jesus. To abolish it and everything. So, all these troubles was coming on and there was, you know, concern about everything and come along an old prophet. Chapter 13, verse one. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel 
and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. This verse two is the important verse. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burned upon thee. See, not only was it prophesied what Josiah was going to do 326 years later, but it even gave him by name in the Word. We think God doesn't see this or see that. God knows all things. God knows all things. So, he goes on, he says, he gave the son the same day, this is a sign which the Lord has spoken, behold, the altar shall be rent and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Well, that's exactly what took place and those priests that had done the altar, it was their bones that was in there and, you know, Josiah ended up burning them you know, get rid of the whole thing. And as a result of that, you know, God did, you know, through Josiah's saying, he, he did bring reform. But see, it wasn't only about, I forget now, 30, 40 years, you know, after that had taken place that Judah, Jerusalem, was carried into captivity in Babylon. And they were there for 70 years and then Remnant came back to be able to build a house again in Jerusalem. But the kingdom was gone at that point. The kingdom was gone, you know. Zerubbabel helped build the temple back, but they were no longer in control of themselves. It was under the Persian Empire, it was under the Greeks and then the Romans. And the Romans had it when Jesus time. But now this prophet what happened to the old prophet? Well, God had told him that when he came to deliver this message out of Bethel, that he was also to return immediately. He was not to stop any place to eat or to drink or do anything. He was to go right, be gone. Came to give the word and then he was leaving. So as he is left now, verse 11 says, now there dwell an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day. And all of a sudden, now he wants to see this prophet that brought this word. So he tells his sons to saddle him in the ass, and he gets on the donkey, and then you know rides out after him, and he catches up with the guy. And he starts telling me that the Lord has spoken to him, and he's on his way home, so it's going to be all right for him to come back and abide with him to have some refreshments and have a meal. But unfortunately, he did that. And then even the one that asked him to stay realized what had happened. And so when he left, it wasn't very long that there was a word come back to him that along the road, the man of God met a lion and the lion killed him right there on the road. And then passers-by would come in and they just pass by on the other side. The reason they passed by on the other side is the lion that killed him was standing guard over him along with the donkey side to side. And the lion didn't touch the donkey. It was just... They knew that God's hand was upon it. So, at this point, the word comes back to the, the other prophet that lured him back to doing what he wasn't supposed to do, which is an example. Sometimes we get things in our mind that, you know, we just have to do this or that this and that. You know, we're just not willing to let it go. You know. We have to be willing to let things go. You know, you know. We don't have to accomplish everything that our mind sets out to. You know, let it go. You know, God knows what we need. He immediately knew that it was the one that he had brought back. So he 
when I, and then he ended up bringing him back, having him buried, entombed in his tomb. And then after he died, before he died, he said, when I die, bury me also with him. And that they are bones side by side. So that was the tomb that Josiah, when he was burning and tearing up things, he let that tomb alone. See, God's in control. God is truly in control. And we fret about this and fret about that. And all we have to do is just give it to the Lord. And then allow Him to have His way. That's the hardest thing, day in and day out. You know. We can look at it globally and say, yeah, okay, I, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. But I also believe in the things I want to do. Yeah. See? That's where it gets us. Not my way, but yours. And we come to that point in life. As Josiah had come to that point in life. He knew that the land needed God's word. God is the answer. God is what we need. God is what our community needs. God is what our country needs. God is what the world needs. Regardless of what man tries to do, they will not change the outcome for God. Blessed are they who are called to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Praise God. Hallelujah. When you go back and read the last three chapters of Revelation, the back of the book. Yeah. And each and every day, living in God's peace. Father God, we give you glory, and Father, we praise you and thank you this morning, Father. And Father, as we come to you in the name of Jesus to hear your words, and Father, if you have spoken to us this morning in a mighty way, Father, we do just pray that these are just not your words that we'll forget before we even get home. Father, we'll pray, Father, now in the name of Jesus, Father, for your quickening Holy Spirit to manifest you know, your Holy Spirit upon these words that the, war, the words are manifested to fulfill those needs, spirit, soul, and body. And Father, as the man with the withered hand, that's the symbolism of not being able to be your vessel in your work as you would have us to do. And you desire for us to be whole. Father, you desire for us, our hands, to be your hands in this world. And a shriveled up river, withered hand is really speaking about a shriveled up spirit. Scriptures talk about the withering so many times and where it parallels our life to the, to the grass and everything and talks about the grass being withered and this being withered. You don't desire any one of us to be withered or shriveled up. You desire for us to be standing strong, just like when you brought the Israelites out of Egypt. You brought them out with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. You desire to do that same thing for each and every one of us. And as you sent forth your disciples, you send us forth in like manner. So Father God, I give you glory and I just give you praise and thanksgiving. Father, I lift up those, Father, that are hearing of the word, Father, that your word tells us when we call upon the name of Jesus, we shall be saved. Just giving it all to you, Lord, and nobody else. You and you alone. To you and you alone do we bow. Father God, we praise you and give you thanksgiving all in the name of Jesus. Amen.
and amen. We're going to close with um, Sweet Hour Prayer 110. Praise the Lord. This robe of flesh shall drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air. Farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Praise the Lord. Go in peace. Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We'll be back Saturday. Yesterday.